Shreya. And I'm Addie. And uh, before we start today, we want to thank each and every one of you for coming out to see us today. We really do appreciate it. So uh, before we get started, I'm going to tell you a little about, about who we are. Um, I'm Shreya Suri. I've been going to Grandview for the past four years. And um, some of the uh, program classes that I've taken are Intro to Programming, AP Computer Science Principles, and AP Computer Science A. Uh, more on the engineering aspect of things, I've also received the Society of Women Engineers Award with the highest honors, and I will be attending Purdue this fall to study computer science. Uh, my name is Adi O'Grady, and I've also been at Grandview for the past four years. Uh, I've taken technology education, computer design, and architecture, and through all these classes, I've figured out that I definitely enjoy engineering the most, so I'll be attending the University of Iowa to study engineering as well as play basketball. So a little bit more about me is that I'm a really heavy sleeper and it takes a lot to wake me up in the morning as I'm sure a lot of you experience the same thing. So the goal of our project was to get me and others out of bed effectively. So we wanted to build a moving alarm clock that would roll off of your nightstand and onto the floor so that you would have to physically get out of bed and turn it off. Um, so this is our company logo. We chose the colors blue, gray, and red. Uh, blue to represent the reliability of our product. We want people to, able, to be able to trust our product to wake them up in the morning. We also chose gray to represent the compact, portable design, indicating that people can take our product wherever they wish. And uh, we chose the color red because it's bold and bright, and we wanted to catch the attention of consumers. We named our product TikTok to play on the common sound that you hear when you think of traditional clocks, TikTok. And um, as you can see, our logo also has a colon in between to indicate the traditional uh, digital or long clock. We also had five project objectives for this year. So my project objectives is that I wanted to be able to stick to my schedule as much as possible. I did not want to procrastinate. I wanted to use my portfolio and this project in general to use to get into the College of Engineering at various colleges. I wanted to get better at collaborating with another person and also get better at doing write-ups because I know that those two things are very important aspects of engineering in general and also computer science. And I wanted to become a better speaker because I've struggled with that in the past. Um, I've also struggled with procrastination, so I wanted to prove to myself and others that I could get an entire project done in, over the course of a year. And then I wanted to get my SOLIDWORKS certification, as well as be able to communicate as part of the group. And I wanted to use this project in my portfolio to get to the College of Engineering at Iowa. So for this project, we had two separate expert advisors, one for each of us, because we're doing different components to the clock. So my expert advisor is Alan Ridlin. And funny enough, he was actually my very first engineering teacher when I was a freshman. And we actually did a final project in that class where we made an alarm clock. It didn't move, but it was still the same idea. So I think it's really fitting that he comes back almost four years later and helps us with our final senior project. He's currently a teacher at the CCIC and teaches advanced manufacturing. Uh, my advisor was Ashi Suri, my dad. He has a master's in computer science and a background in electrical engineering. So he was a perfect fit for our project, considering that I was working on the electrical as well as the programming aspect of this project. Um, he is a senior business intelligence, intelligence developer at Canada World and Goodson. Um, some of our other support advisors are Mary O'Grady, Addie's mom, she was a financial support advisor, uh, Irene Mathias, who is a senior at Grand High School, uh, Sophie Sokin, who is a freshman at the University of Colorado Denver, and Kate Joukowsky, who is a freshman at the University of Notre Dame. So our project timeline uh, started off in the initial months with our initial research. So in the month of October, Shreya was going to research microprocessors and how that was going to apply to our project, as well as which one she was going to use. Um, while she was doing that, I was doing my initial research on the structure of the clock and the material and the light sound display and all that. Um, then we moved into November, where Shreya was going to learn how to program the Arduino, as well as research the Wi-Fi application piece to the uh, clock. While she was doing that, I was researching how to stress test in SOLIDWORKS and all the different types that would be helpful for our project, uh, as well as researching how to physically assemble it. And then in December, Shreya started researching the electrical aspect of the clock and how she was going to connect all the components and make them work, while I was creating hand drawings and putting those parts into SOLIDWORKS so that we could simulate it. 
as you can see, we actually did completely stick to our schedule for these first semester months. And then in January, we got a little bit off track of what we wanted to do. What we wanted to do was start programming the clock and print the initial clock body. But um, instead, um, with, um, with this project, I had to learn the programming language C++. So during the month of January, I didn't feel comfortable enough to start actually programming our clock. So I continued to practice programming C++. And um, at that time, we were still receiving materials. So Addy was updating components of the clock body into solvers. And then in February, we had expected that we were going to have all of our materials already and that we were going to be able to have our prototypes printed and we're going to be able to put it into the clock. And then in March, we were going to edit any problems that we saw in the code, as well as fix any structural and design issues. Um, I also was going to stress test during this time so that I could fix any problems with uh, the stress that was going to be put on the clock when it was falling, as well as reprinting any prototypes that we needed, and Shreya was going to create an app so that we could easily program the clock. So uh, during the month of February, as our clock had not been yet printed, we only were able to put together the Arduino, but we couldn't do it to the clock. We also had to push back our initial testing as the clock was not yet printed. Um, I, um, on my aspect of things, I started programming the code, which I had pushed back from January, and um, we did buy all of our materials, and we received them all by the end of February, which is why in March we were able to print and reprint all components of our clock body. Um, in March, I also edited the program and fixed some of the issues, and we conducted our initial tests. Um, finally, in April, we uh, finished and practiced the presentation that you are watching today. We, I finished troubleshooting my code, and uh, we put together the final version of the clock. Okay, so a little bit about my initial research was that I was going to research different forms of alarm clocks and how they wake you up in uh, unique ways. So one of them was called the Pavlov shock clock, which was basically a wristband that you would wear, and it would shock you and not let you uh, snooze, basically. I didn't want to incorporate the shock design into our clock, but I did want to use um, the fact that it didn't let you snooze, because that is one of the reasons why people are such heavy sleepers, because they constantly click the snooze button. Um, another clock was called Ruggy, and this clock made you physically get out of bed and step on the clock for a set period of time in order to turn it off. So I wanted to use that idea of physically getting you out of bed to wake you up in our clock design. And then Clocky and Talky are other clocks that are similar to what we made. And a lot of people complained about Talky not being able to roll as smoothly because it didn't have wheels, so I wanted to incorporate wheels into our design. And then I also had to research different components that we were going to do or going to make in the clock. So the first thing I had to research was what structure we wanted to make it. Um, I didn't want to do an oval or a circular shape because those two clocks I previously mentioned already had that design, so I wanted to make it different. And then I um, triangles are one of the strongest shapes that you can have because when force is applied to one side of it, it is equally spread over the entire thing, so I decided to go with a triangle and a triangular prism for the actual body of the clock. I also had to decide what size I was going to make it. It had to be small enough so that it wasn't bulky and awkward, and I had to make it big enough so that it would fit all the components in properly. I also had to decide what material we were going to make it. It had to be a very durable material, as well as cheap and flexible. So we ultimately decided to go with plastic, and specifically PLA plastic, because it was cheap, and it was the plastic that Mr. Combs had available for us to print with. Um, I also had to research the light display, and basically I got narrowed down between an LED and an LCD display. Basically the difference is that an LCD is fluorescent lights and LEDs are LEDs. Um, LEDs I found last a little bit longer and are better for your eyes and the environment overall. But the LCD display was a lot more compatible with the Arduino, so we ultimately decided to go with that. But we did compromise because it was backlit by an LED backlight, so it was all good. Um, we I also researched the sound display. And it varies on person whether people like to be woken up by a loud startling noise or one with a melody. But for our purposes, we wanted to be loud and startling because it would more effectively get you out of bed. And then the last thing that I did for my initial research was researching how to stress test. Um, I researched a bunch of different types of stress testing, like thermal and vibrational and motion. 
but the one that would be most useful for our project is the drop test because you can simulate um, an object falling from a set height and you can just select the plane that tells it which direction gravity is and you can see where the stress and strains place on the object so on that object you can see that there the green indicates that there's a little bit of stress being placed on the bottom and creeping up to the top and the goal is to keep it in the blue, so that's what we were going to do for our project. And then I had to research how we were going to physically assemble the clock. So most of it was going to be, the main clock body is 3D printed, so it would stay intact like fine, but um, I also had to use screws and hinges and glues to, glue to connect the other components. So now I'm going to give you a little background on my initial research. So when I started off this project, I had very uh, minimal knowledge on what I was actually going to be getting into. I knew that microprocessors were a thing, but I had absolutely no clue what they did. So uh, that was a big part of my initial research. I looked um, into microprocessors, and that eventually led me to memory controllers. Um, a microprocessor is essentially a mini computer. It functions in a way, um, to, it does logic functions, such as math. But on the other hand, microcontrollers uh, have a multi-component usability, which means that you can use a microcontroller in order to control other devices like LCDs and motors. So I centered my approach more towards a microcontroller because that is what I wanted to be able to do with our project, which was control the LCD, the motors, and the speakers. So from there, I narrowed it down to two microcontrollers, the Raspberry Pi and the Arduino Uno, and I will be referencing the Arduino Uno many times in the future, so uh, I ultimately chose the Arduino Uno not only because it was cheaper, but because the user interface was a lot easier to deal with, and there were a lot more tutorials available for me. As um, with the Arduino Uno, I had to learn C++, and that is why I was led to an online uh, website called Tinkercad, where I could simulate um, programming Arduinos and setting them up. So. Uh, there in the top left, I programmed a speaker, and then I programmed a D and two motors. And um, all of that practice eventually led me to my initial research where I programmed um, an LCD a speaker and a motor all together at once, like I was intending to do with my project. Um, over here is this large piece of code. Explain all the nitty gritty details of it. It's just a piece of code that allows the speaker to play Silent Night. And um, the code as a whole essentially just broke up the notes and beats into different aspects and programmed them from there. Mm -hmm. um, also, part of my initial research, um, I had to choose which materials to use beyond just the Arduino Uno. So uh, there's the Arduino Uno. And I also chose a continuous servo motor that uh, runs 360 degrees. As for this project, as the clock had to run off of the nightstand, I needed it to continuously move around in 360 degrees. And then part of my project was the design elements. So before we got all the materials, I found dimensions online and was able to create hand drawings, as you can see on the left. And then once we got our actual materials, I found that a lot of the dimensions that I got online were correct, so I had to go back and update them later in SOLIDWORKS parts, as you can see over there. Some of the other materials I got were wheels, obviously, and um, a breadboard. And for those of you who don't know what breadboards are, they essentially act as a medium between your Arduino you know, and external components like the LCD. Um, so with all of my materials, I had uh, quite a few issues. So I, orig I originally started off with a regular LCD. However, um, my LCD did not display text, and it would only uh, display um, it would only have a light if it was propped up at an angle. Well, ultimately, that was likely due to a circuitry issue. I ultimately switched to the I squared C LCD, which streamlined the process considering it only had four wires compared to the 12 wires that a regular LCD had. And it also does display text, as you can see, I made a display for the moment. Um, On to the motor. Uh, I had quite a few issues with the motors. Um, starting off, our motors were running at two different speeds which was quite problematic considering if I wanted the clock to run properly, it, the wheels would have to run at the same speed. So I uh, did some digging on Arduino forums and I found out that all motors are not created the same and um, I would have to manually change the automatic speed that the motor would have to run at in order for, uh, 
for the Motors to Rock the Speed. So I downloaded this online library called Bar Speed Servo in order to uh, manually change the speed of both motors to a speed of five. Um, however, that ultimately did not change anything as the motors continue to run at two different speeds. So ultimately, I ordered a new motor and it worked perfectly after that. Uh, On to the battery. We had issues with the battery. Uh, we still have issues with the battery, actually, but I will get into that later. But uh, starting off, I ordered a 9 volt battery with an on and off switch because I wanted the battery to be user friendly and easy for people to turn off the clock whenever they wished. Um, however, the problem with that and was that it wouldn't power the Arduino properly when it was alone because it didn't have enough current. So um, it would start up the Arduino and it would start up all of the LCD and then it would quickly die. So um, I did some more digging on Arduino forums and my knowledge in physics informed me that um, having more batteries together in parallel would provide more current to all aspects of all devices uh, connected to the Arduino, so I, I switched to six 1.5 volt batteries in parallel, and that definitely seemed to fix most of the problem. It doesn't fix it perfectly, but it is able to properly run the motor and the LCD at the same time. Um, more issues with the materials. I initially ordered um, this speaker down here, which uh, I ordered off the Arduino website, assuming that it would be compatible with the Arduino Uno. However, um, it was not. It just couldn't connect directly to the Arduino Uno. So I switched to the motor, I know, or sorry, this speaker that you see up there, which is just two simple connections, and it connects to the ground, which is just the negative port, and just a pin on the Arduino, so it's easy to program. And I also had issues with the real-time clock module, but before I get into that, um, a real-time clock module is essentially before that. <laughs> Arduinos are terrible at uh, ticking time because every time you turn it off, it's going to stop ticking the time. So I required a real-time clock module in order to keep like keep track of the time in the seconds like a clock does. So I had to purchase a real-time clock module and I originally purchased the smartphone one down here, but that was incompatible with my project because I had an Arduino Uno and they're just two completely different interfaces. So I had to switch to the DS3231 uh, real-time clock module, which was compatible with the Arduino. Here's me setting up the clock, it's just a little time lapse. So I started off with a real-time clock module. And um, as you can see, on the left, I uh, inserted a circuit diagram of what my entire, uh, what the entire project looks like from the inside. And here's me set up the LCD, and now I'm setting the motors. Sorry, this takes a little bit of time. And now I picked up the speaker. Okay, so my part of the project was the design and structural piece. So this is our very first prototype. Um, I had to print this a little bit in a rush because we were just getting all our materials in, so it's very basic. I just wanted to see how everything was going to fit. So the main um, components that I had to include for this was a hole for the LCD display to come out so you could see the time from the outside, um, as well as creating a hole for the motors to run through and connect to the wheels. And I also had to have part of it um, unattached so that we could configure all the materials from the outside. So I, we had a lot of problems with this, obviously. It is significantly smaller than all of our other models. And at the time, in theory and in SolidWorks, it does fit all the materials. But that was when I had the dimensions that were a little bit too small. Um, and I forgot to take into consideration the amount of space that all the wires would take up. So that was our first issue with the first prototype. Um, I also for, I needed to add um, extra pieces of plastic so that the different components like the LCD and motors could connect from the inside of the clock and be screwed in so they wouldn't fall when they were going to hit the ground. And I also had to change the motor hole almost entirely. It's the motor right here, the white part is the rotating part and we originally planned for that to go directly from the inside and connect to the wheels, but the width of the clock body was just too much for it to actually connect to the wheels directly. So I needed to make it a little bit bigger, so we used the um, circle and the semicircle um, underneath the rotating part of the motor and made that as the hole so that the whole rotating part of the motor could actually connect to the wheels. 
And then the last issue I had with the first prototype was that the right side opening would be way too small to actually configure any of the materials inside the clock. So then, this is our second prototype. It is significantly bigger. And I fixed the, um, I made the back attachment instead of it on the right side so that we could actually configure all of the components more easily. And then I had to make the motor holes, the shape that I just said, uh, so that they can actually fit through and rotate the wheels. And then I had to make a hole for the battery so that we could actually switch it on and off from outside the clock instead of opening it. And then I made extra pieces of plastic here for the LCD to screw into, as well as for the motors on the side. And then this is a video of all the components inside the clock. As you can see, it's moving, but it's moving in a circle, which is not ideal for what we wanted the clock to do. So originally we thought it was an issue with the orientation of the motor holes, because when I made it in SOLIDWORKS, I made the cut through all. So it was symmetrical on both sides, so I thought that they were running in the same direction, but they were really just flipped. So that was one of the adjustments I wanted to make. The third prototype was to flip the orientation of one of the motor holes. So here's our last prototype. So as you can see, I did flip one of the orientations of the hole, the small sides on this side here and over here. But we did find out it was a problem with the code, and we fixed that later. But it didn't affect anything by changing the orientation. Um, I also had to make the back attachment a little bit smaller from what it was originally because it was going to be connected by hinges and it was overlapping with this part on the second prototype. Um, also, when we tried to configure it, the battery had a wire that connected directly to the Arduino, but it was on the right side, so it was getting in the way, and the clock body was getting in the way of that, so I had to change it to the other side and made the hole a little bit bigger so it was easier to switch on and off. And then um, we originally planned to have two hinges on either side to open the clock like this, but these hinges were a little bit too small and didn't go um, all the way from the front of the clock body and reach to the back, so we found a bigger hinge and just decided to do one of those. And then while I was doing the physical assembly, I also was doing stress testing in SOLIDWORKS. That's our first stress test. As you can see, there's a lot of stress being put on the corners of the clock, which was not good for our project, and after discussing with my advisor, we decided to rip the edges, or basically put extra pieces of plastic on the edges so that not enough, not as much pressure was put on them. And then that's the final stress test with those ripped edges, and you can see that there's almost no stress or strain being put on the corners anymore, and only a little bit traveling on the sides. And then this is our final clock body, where we made all the adjustments that we had to make the LCD display, and inside I had to change that a little bit because Shreya switched the LCDs halfway through the project. It wasn't that big of a deal, just a little update, so it works. And then the motor holes, we kept the same from the third prototype, and then we switched where the battery opening was to the left side, made it a little bit bigger so it was easier, and then we added a singular hinge to the top so that it would open and close easier, and then we had to add a turn button, which is that thing over there, so that the back flop wouldn't fly open when it hit the ground. This is a time lapse of me putting together the clock. Um, right now I'm screwing in the LCD so that it wouldn't topple over when it fell on the ground. And then next I'm putting in the motors and then I have to attach those directly to the wheels. And then I hot glued some bigger wheels onto the clock so it's more durable. Then I put on the hinge so it connects from the top of the clock to the back. And then I put everything inside and added the turn button so the back would stay shut. So um, I'm just going to give like a quick overview of um, some of the main parts of my code. So obviously, the two big parts of this project were the alarm and the moving motors. So um, I inserted this little snippet from the alarm code, which is an if statement. And it says if hour is equal to 12 and then it is 1. So essentially, if it's 12.01, that's when the buzzer, servo 1 and servo 2. Um, the buzzer is going to be the alarm, um, the alarm sound. And servo 1 and servo 2 would be the motors. And I also um, cleared the LCD and had the LCD print alarm on and wake up. Um, onto the motor, I specifically included this uh, piece of code in reference to the uh, uh, issue Addy mentioned earlier with our clock moving around in circles. While we did initially think it was a design flaw, it actually ended up being 
an issue with the, the code specifically this by like here where it says it goes from negative start angle to mm -hmm. stop angle. Um, with our the motors were going in um, the same we're going in opposite directions. So um, I one motor was going from start angle to stop angle and then the other was also going from start angle to stop angle. Which means that they were going in different directions. So um, I just had it to add a negative in order for the motors, one of the motors to switch directions so that they ultimately ran in the same direction. Um, so here are some issues with our final product. So um, as I mentioned before, um, the battery does not work perfectly. It still struggles to completely power all aspects of the clock effectively. While it can light up the LCD and uh, power the motors and the speakers, and the real-time clock module, it doesn't do it consistently enough um, because it just struggles with the power aspect of it, like giving out power. And then there's also a design um, fault in this that I made the wheels a little bit too small, so when, when you um, roll it off of the surface, the wheels are too small and too close to, um, the clock body is too close to the ground, so when it rolls off, the back end of it catches on the surface and it falls face first, which is not ideal for our project. But if I made the wheels um, both bigger in radius and in width, as well as make them a little bit, uh, the clock body a little bit further off the ground, I don't think this problem would happen. There it is. <laughs> it's caught on the back. <laughs> But here is um, our final product. Um, too, too bad upload quality, unfortunately, because this is a PowerPoint. You can't see it at the beginning, um, but you can see the perfect video on our website. It does say alarm on and, oh, and uh, before, um, we had to connect it to the computer, obviously, due to the issues with the battery. And um, we had to hold it up so that my computer did not fall off the computer. No, it didn't fall off the table. Be sound, but... Oh, it's on. The speaker's on. Well, it's okay. It's making a beeping noise. It's making a beeping noise. <laughs> I'll trust you. I'll trust you. It's on the website. <laughs> okay. okay. Next steps in our project. If we had more time, I would fix the design of the wheels um, so that it wouldn't get caught on the edge of the surface and fall face forward, so it could actually do its job and roll around on the floor. Um, I would also make it more user friendly because right now. It's a little hard to open the clock and rearrange all the materials, all the components in the clock. So if you had any problems with it and didn't and weren't like familiar with the um, components inside the clock, it would be really hard to fix. And then also, I would want to make it more marketable. And to do that, I would have to go back to talking clocky, like I mentioned at the beginning of the PowerPoint, and see what um, what kind of profit they are making and what. Are, what they are selling their product for and how much it costs to produce it so that we can have a um, product that can compete with those. Um, on my aspect of things, as I mentioned at the beginning, I didn't actually get to uh, an app. Um, so I would create the app to make it more user friendly and the app would include things like allowing um, the user to change what sound they would wake up to. Um, you guys didn't hear it, but the sound that Originally, Charles was just a traditional alarm sound, and it was very loud and annoying, and some people don't like that, as I mentioned. But I would also um, make it more user-friendly by allowing um, them to change what time they want to be open at beds. Um, I would also make the on and off button more accessible, as with the change in our battery, we also lost the on and off button, so I would have to uh, find a new route in order to make the on and off button more accessible. And finally, I would like to get a battery that can perfectly support all the materials at all times. This is our bibliography. Thank you guys so much for listening. Do you have any questions? Vincent? So the electronics inside weren't designed by you. So is there like any stress involved in it when it falls off the table? <laughs> or am I just imagining things of, like stress potentially breaking some things inside? Um the it wouldn't get caught like on the surface. It would it would be like directly on the wheels, which we did stress test in the initial one. And most of the stress would be from falling. It would like tilt a little bit on the corners, which we uh, did the ribbed edges to account for that. What you're asking? Um, there's also um, most of the paintings are screwed in, as Addy mentioned. Yeah, all the components are screwed in, so they're not going to move around when they fall. That's a big one. Okay.
Other questions? Why did you see plus plus instead of like C, Rust, Go, or any other systems for that? Um, so the Arduino IDE actually just comes in C++, mm -hmm. so um, I wasn't able to choose any other language. Any other questions? All right, good job, you guys. Well done.